Hello everyone and welcome back. We're here for our third and final panel today titled Subjectivities in Conceptual Art and Family Photos. Again, please remember to enter your questions in the Q&A window and we will respond to them at the end of both presentations. Our first speaker is Daniel Thomas. Thomas completed his BFA in painting and drawing here at CCA. His paintings grapple with the potentials and problematics of queer abstraction through glam, rave, and house music aesthetics. In his master's thesis, entitled Chemsex, Transition, Diaspora, and Homecoming, he reflects on the subjectivity of feeling at home both in the nation state and in the body, combining transgender and diasporic methodologies. Our second and final speaker is Sam Soon. Soon was born in Chengdu, China, and raised in San Mateo, California. They are a dual degree candidate, earning a master's degree in fine arts and in visual and critical studies. Their practice and research explores the relationships between memories and histories as they converge in family archives. These relationships are often muddled by fractures, violence, and forgetting. In their photo-based and installation works, these relationships manifest through visual distortion, manipulation, and omission. Soon's talk today is titled, Tell Me Who You Are, Imperfection, Waste Not, and My Grandmother's Album. We begin with Daniel Thomas. Hello, my name is Daniel Thomas, and I'll be delivering a presentation based on my thesis research entitled Chemsex, Diaspora and Transition in Rosha Yagmai's Miracle Grove. Rosha Yagmai named her oversized and proportionally distorted 2019 installation after an artificial accelerant for plant growth, Miracle Grow. Just as fertilizer constitutes a slippage between the engineered and the natural, Yagmai's installation conceptually challenged the capacity of nature, naturalness, and naturalization to certify and normalize an unmarked identity vis-a-vis -vis unnatural others. Through its monstrous aesthetics, Miracle Grow modeled a mode of embodiment in which the ambiguous, composite, and sutured self can flourish in unnatural abjection. Here we see an overview of Yagmai's installation at the Wattis Institute for Contemporary Arts Rear Gallery. The five major components of the installation loosely represented a bathroom, albeit fantastically out of scale. A false floor made of MDF and fake grout stood in for the bathroom's ceramic tile flooring. Two series of vertically wall-mounted black panels represented the bathroom's base cove tiles. A pipe perpendicularly penetrated the west wall, emanating flickering light and garbled sounds. A bug zapper glowed in the corner. A 17 foot long tubular sculpture held center stage, standing in for a massively oversized hair. The complex gnarled surface of this hair-like sculpture was profusely encrusted with household plastics, beauty products, miracle grow fertilizer, silicone body casts, and a menagerie of other materials. There were casts of a hand, navel, ear, and unidentifiable flesh adhered to the hair-like sculpture in ways that confounded normative anatomies. The artist was inspired to make Miracle Grow when she imagined viewing her bathroom from a spider's perspective. Yagmai saw a spider crawling towards her discarded clothes as she stepped into the shower. Startled by the spider, the artist whisked away her clothes and both she and the spider froze. The spider's landscape was instantly erased. What does the spider think just happened? The artist wondered. The installation reconstructs the scene of this encounter from the perspective of the spider, magnifying the bathroom relative to the erected small body. With the artist's diasporic biography and relevant theories of trans embodiment in mind, the installation alludes to so much more than the spider encounter. Rather than art historically contextualizing Miracle Grow or providing an overview of Yagmai's oeuvre, my study here contributes to deconstructive and transnational turns in transgender theory in conversation with diaspora studies. 
As the artist is Iranian American and a Farsi song plays in the installation space, diaspora has a self-evident relationship to the artist's biography and to the artwork itself. I apply transgender theory in an innovative, deconstructive manner. The artist herself is not transgender. Until recently, transgender theory has been preoccupied with diaristic accounts of gender modification with a narrow focus on the trans body. Jay Prosser's 1998 book, Second Skins, epitomizes this autobiographical category. Since then, trans theory has expanded to encompass trans deconstruction and cultural criticism. More contemporary trans theorists such as Lucas Crawford look for transgender subjectivity in sites other than the trans body, the autobiography, and the operating table. I am indebted to Crawford, especially for his development of transgender theory as a deconstructive hermeneutic and as a visual critical strategy. I have used different critical frameworks to link the installation to transgender. In my thesis, I deployed Crawford's notion of body as archive, as elaborated in his 2010 essay, Breaking Ground on a Theory of Transgender Architecture, to theorize the central sculpture in Miracle Grow as a body archive. I then ruminated on the nostalgic temporality of the archive per Derrida's archive fever in conversation with the diasporic nostalgia Stuart Hall writes against in cultural identity and diaspora. Alternately, in this presentation, I'll be deploying Susan Stryker's framework of monstrosity as elaborated in her 1994 essay, My Words to Victor Frankenstein Above the Village of Shamuni, Performing Transgender Rage. I will here seek to deconstruct the ways ostensible naturalness and naturalization subtend normative subject positions vis-a-vis -vis the figure of the monster, the unassimilable, unnatural other. Miracle Grow's monstrous and grotesque visuality makes it suitable for such a theoretical encoding. My methodologies intersect. Gender parallels the terrain of the nation state. Both are spatialized with borders and crossings. Susan Stryker and Aaron Azura broadly assert that, quote, transgender is intimately bound up with questions of nation, territory, and citizenship, with categories of belonging and exclusion, and with all processes through which individual corporealities become aggregated as bodies politic, end quote. Yagmai's family history involves diasporic border crossings that complicate categories of belonging and foreignness. Yagmai's father, Siamak, first came to Berkeley, California from Isfahan province, Iran in 1965. Yagmai's parents met in California but moved to Iran and planned to live there and raise a family there. The Iranian revolution upended these plans and the family moved back to California, settling in Santa Monica. Siamak also brought his parents back to Santa Monica with his wife and child. The grandparents would often supervise young Rosha and her brother Amir in the US, but the grandparents only spoke Farsi. Rosha and Amir only spoke English. The audio track in the installation reflected on this diasporic subject position and these intergenerational migrant family relationships. The flickering light in the pipe came from a television screen butted up against the terminus of the pipe behind the wall, which played the first season of Three's Company, a sitcom the artist and her brother watched as youths. Here's an excerpt from the opening credits of Three's Company. The heavily edited audio track the visitors heard in the gallery records the artist and her brother singing the Three's Company theme song and the brother singing Ruhunaha, a river song. This combination of an American TV show theme song with a Persian pop song sonically maps the artist's diasporic filial past with movements between both places. Here's an excerpt from the music video for River Song. The combined audio track counters hegemonic forms of American belonging through its deployment of Farsi. It also resists legibility under coherent identity politics through its garbled hybridity. The audio is distorted to the threshold of meaninglessness. Here's what visitors heard in the gallery.
Yakmai here performs a conceptual double movement, asserting her difference from non-immigrant Anglophonic Americanness while simultaneously obscuring that difference, rendering it garbled and hardly discernible. The track conveys a knowing, mystery, and alienation. With a father reluctant to discuss his experiences in Iran and grandparents with whom she could not converse in a shared tongue, the garbledness of the audio conveys how Yagmai was generationally cut off from a comprehensive knowledge of her Persian filial past. Miracle Grow stages a bathroom, an anxious, phobic space of reactionary transgender discourse. Furthermore, Miracle Grow stages pipes and tubes in a bathroom, pipes and tubes being common euphemisms for aspects of reproductive anatomy. Hair is a salient site of gender performance, and a strand of hair is here magnified to massive scale. Trans theory in relation to Miracle Grow helps make sense of the issues of medicalized embodiment, reproduction, sex body monstrosity, and the myth of the natural body in the installation. A cisgender woman, Yagmai says of her broader practice that she reflects on, quote, the melancholia of only getting one body, end quote. A statement dense with transgender subjectivity as it ruminates on our enfleshed stuckness despite changing identities. Yakmai's biography remains relevant here. She recalls, quote, the whole time I was making this show, my partner and I were doing IVF. The idea of your given body and your DNA are relevant to Miracle Grow, especially regarding the promise of fruitfulness and fertility that the title suggests. When I think of my body, I think of a man's body. IVF, like Miracle Grow, uses chemicals to change the function and patterns of your body, end quote. Surprisingly genderqueer and contranatural subjectivity arises in this cisgender artist's self-narrative of her pregnancy. While Yakmai pursued IVF with her male partner, the procedure nonetheless represents a rather queer approach to reproduction as it complicates simplistic formulations of the natural. In her aforementioned Frankenstein essay, Stryker writes of her own transsexual embodiment in a way that seems to simultaneously describe her body and the central sculpture in Miracle Grow. Quote, the transsexual body is an unnatural body. It is the product of medical science. It is a technological construction. It is flesh torn apart and sewn together in, again in a shape other than that in which it was born. In these circumstances, I find a deep affinity between myself as a transsexual woman and the monster in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, end quote. Like the transgender body that Stryker describes, the central hair-like sculpture in Miracle Grow is a gender-troubling anatomical collage of silicone body casts. A monstrous amalgam, the sculpture unravels coherent gender identity and normative sex embodiment. Both Miracle Grow and anti-transphobic politics urge an unpacking of the meaning of nature and how ostensible nature and naturalness subtend socially viable identities. Stryker exhorts such a skeptical examination of the natural, writing from the transgender eye, quote, Hearken unto me, fellow creatures, I whose flesh has become an assemblage of incongruous anatomical parts, I who achieve the similitude of a natural body only through an unnatural process, I offer you this warning. The nature you bedevil me with is a lie. Do not trust it to protect you from what I represent, for it is a fabrication that cloaks the groundlessness of the privilege you seek to maintain for yourself at my expense. You are as constructed as me. I call upon you to investigate your nature as I have been compelled to confront mine. I challenge you to risk abjection and flourish as well as have I. Heed my words and you may well discover the seams and sutures in yourself." End quote. As an unnatural body, Miracle Grow confronts the viewer as an incongruent monster, an uncognizable assemblage that defies reactionary ideologies of belonging based on naturalness, naturalization, and corporeal normativity. Miracle Grow's titular reference to fertilizer announced its contranatural conceptual project. Its warped synthetic silicone skins, imbricated in a chemical amalgam of fertilizer and beauty products, constituted an incongruent unnatural, monstrous body. Miracle Grow's transnational character suggested another kind of monstrosity, a hybrid diasporic cultural identity that confounds categories of foreignness and belonging. Miracle Grow was a transgressive celebration of diasporic subjectivities and queer contranatural embodiments through the monstrous 
and abject, frameworks that allow for flourishing in hybrid, composite, sutured, and internally contradictory identities. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sam Soon, and my presentation is titled, Tell Me Who You Are, Imperfections and Waste Not and My Grandmother's Album. My grandmother and I were sitting together when the words tumbled out. What's the worst thing you've ever experienced? Her question jolted me. Silence hung between us and all I could manage was, I can't tell you. I've thought a lot about this moment and how I could tell she was asking because she wanted to know me better. But I don't think me not sharing my worst things denied her the opportunity to know me better. She knew me deeply without me having to tell her. She passed away in January and Though I've been waiting through our family archives for some time now, new things seem to surface every day that affirm my belief that we can engage with each other and with our ancestors as complex people by being attuned to the idiosyncrasies in the archives they leave behind. In one of the albums I've discovered, photos of only my grandfather fill the black pages. Beside them, snarky captions poke fun at him. I'm struck by how much of her personality is conveyed through this thin book. Similarly, Beijing-based artist Song Dong and his collaboration with his mother, Jia Xiangyuan, titled Waste Not, was first installed in 2005 at Beijing Tokyo Art Project. In 2009, the Museum of Modern Art displayed the project. The piece was sprawling, filling nearly 3,000 square feet with over 10,000 objects. Zhao had collected through her lifetime. A fragile wooden house serves as waste knots beating heart, but instead of veins and valves, rows of decorative mooncake bags and two liter bottles cover the floor. The house is surrounded by undulating piles of artifacts from Zhao's daily life. Mountains of styrofoam and bird cages frame the installation's entrance, while boxes brimming with stuffed animals and bed frames stockpiled with medication bottles guard the east wall. In a small collection of strings, Waste Not Reorients, our understanding of family archives, moving beyond the classic idealized photo album into something that encompasses the messy and banal rituals of everyday life. In reading these two family archives together, what I term imperfections arise that reconfigure many binary assumptions about family archives. Critic Hal Foster writes that archival work creates the opportunity to engage with the past beyond its trauma. Towards this goal, I find the term imperfection to be useful in con <clears throat> to be useful, oh shoot, sorry. <laughs> to be useful by contrasting more traditional forms, which focus on cultivating a positive family narrative, often omitting visual remnants that would suggest otherwise. Imperfection describes the moments when these archives break with tradition, refusing to reproduce images of perfection. These tensions help us engage comprehensively with the past, furthering Foster's archival potential. In the fissures these imperfections produce, complex narratives about these women take hold, narratives that more traditional forms abstract. These imperfections pave a way to engage deeper with joy beyond trauma and love as a means of survival. Zhao's cords and strings present one of these imperfections through dirt and mess. Bundled and bound using the same methods, Waste Knot's collection of string inhabits four planks of wood and includes, <clears throat> includes pieces ranging from string to yarn to satin ribbon to even a lanyard and a leash. All of them are used in fraying. In addressing the autobiographical nature of family archival practices, sociologist Robert Zussman writes that, quote, photo albums are selective. In particular, they're often fictions and tend to put their subjects in an idealized light. Zussman also notes that many self-representations contained in photo albums celebrate the relationships pictured within. But in Waste Not, the strings are worn and dirty. They've even been classified as junk by the Waste Knots curator, Wu Hong. 
These chords and strings embody archival imperfection because they pose a stark contrast to the idyllic imagination of family life portrayed in typical family albums. The strings and chords carrying all their stains fail to engage a family narrative that excludes struggle or disruption. In doing so, jazz strings and chords open the possibility for a more comprehensive family history to take form. Though my grandmother's album has romanticized photos of my grandfather, her captions agitate that vision. Many photographs of him are shot from below, intended to make him look powerful. He smiles in some, he's young and handsome. Yet the captions have an irreverent self-awareness that confront the images they go with. Captions such as, forgot your key, next to an image of my grandfather sitting on outdoor steps taunt him. My grandmother's captions break with expectations about how captions should function, obscuring information about the photographs and becoming containers for her wit. Her irreverent captions cut through veneers of perfection. My grandmother's captions are similar to Zhao's strings insofar as they both transform the familiar fami family archive into something more. For Waste Not, the self-awareness manifests in deteriorating objects like the strings and cords. It also appears through the mass of objects, rejecting a curated home life. Through their respective interpretations of family archives, both archivists maintain some traditional elements while rejecting others. In doing so, their archives offer clearer glimpses into their own interiorities. In addition to visual imperfections, Subliminal deviations from traditional family archives also fall under imperfection, expanding to include how these women subvert gendered divisions of archival labor. As Joan Solomon writes, quote, women are most often the archivists or historians in maintaining the family album, in diary writing, in the keeping of scrapbooks and personal memorabilia. We use the term family album to mean that collection of life moments where what is positive in family experiences has been recorded, end quote. The dirt and grime on the string surfaces hardly represent a strictly positive family life. The chaotic throng makes it difficult to parse out positive from negative, and this complicates Zhao's role as her family's historian. Though she takes up the traditional women's work of keeping her family's history, the narrative she weaves doesn't focus solely on familial bliss. Meanwhile, my grandmother's album more directly challenges gender divides in family archives. Curator Eric Kessels notes, quote, it was mostly men taking pictures of their partners. It was them who had the machine around their necks, end quote. This is true of my grandmother's other albums, making this particular album atypical both in a personal family history and in a broader historical context of family photography. The album's photographs of my grandfather had to have been taken by my grandmother, as it would have been odd for friends to photograph him in intimate settings like laying on his bed. This album contains a woman's perspective throughout, contrasting the dynamic Kessels observes. By tra the traditionally masculine labor associated with operating the camera blurs with the traditionally feminized labor of assembling the album. Each photograph captures her way of looking at him, each caption provides her commentary, and each page reflects her curation. This subversion continues in examining Waste Not and my grandmother's album alongside public histories. While I infer Jia's sentimentality and her frugality from Waste Not, other aspects of her life help clarify the findings on the object surfaces. Addressing the brown twine, Jia wrote that there's also some, some string that she ping twined but I don't really want to use that either. I've never been able to do them as properly as he could. Like many of Waste Knot's objects, the strings epitomize the admiration Zhao had for his, her husband's resourcefulness. The strings remind her of the unspoken ways Xi Ping would care for her through the strings he twined well. Additionally, Xi Ping's ingenuity that Zhao so admired resulted from traditional values and wartime scarcity. Growing up in China during the Second Sino-Japanese War and entering motherhood during the Chinese Civil War and the Cultural Revolution influenced Zhao's sense of material uncertainty. 
the sense that she had to make do with whatever she had was also a collective mindset verified by traditional Chinese values of frugality. During these times of political upheaval, the frugality exhibited by Xi Ping's twining and Zhao's collecting became as much evidence of their care for one another as it was their method of survival. As such, these objects are also remnants of the microcosm of stability they cultivated together. These historical events also provide a link between Waste Knot and my grandmother's album. Though they both grew up during the Second Sino-Japanese War, my grandmother came to the United States as the Chinese Civil War gained momentum. With rising anti-communist fears, communication with her family in China became sparse and return became impossible. In light of this uncertainty, she found familial comfort with my grandfather. This poses yet another disparity between her album of my grandfather and other albums. Zussman writes to this point, quote, most fundamentally, the photo albums I have seen are thoroughly peopled. They include few pictures of places or things and seemingly endless pictures of family and friends. While true for my grandmother's other albums, this one contains only my grandfather. They never appear together. His singularity and repetition not only counter predominant album formats, they also maintain her love for him, paralleling the love between Zhao and Shang, Song Xingping. Both archives function within the understanding that these women's relationships could not be sufficiently expressed through shows of perfection, troubling essentializing differences between people who remain in their countries of origin and people who leave. When I first began my work with family archives, I felt so desperate looking for clues that told me who my ancestors were. In thinking about how best to conclude this presentation, I asked my mom what she thought. And she said, sometimes we learn more from pe who people show us they are than who they tell us. Not to be biased, but I think this is pretty wise. In my grandmother's album and Waste Not, Zhao and my grandmother share so much of who they are in the glittering imperfections they leave behind. By being attuned to these imperfections, by seeing them as opportunities for people to show us who they are, we receive more complex stories of care, joy, and resilience. I think I'll now amend my title because sometimes, as my mom aptly puts it, sometimes they just show us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam and Daniel. Um, I wanted to begin, um, you know, as I'm listening to your talks, I'm thinking about issues of assimilation and it's like your talks seem to bracket a lot of those problems that of not fitting in and being outside. Um, Daniel and yours, there's discussion of the monstrous and the abject. And on the other side with Sam, we see loss and uh, somewhat melancholy kind of sense of um, that process. So I'm wondering if both of you could speak for a moment about how in your research process, you encountered um, moments of resistance to that binary, perhaps through queering, and by that I mean as a verb, where um, there is a pushback against this inside outside as a way of making space. And um, I actually want to start with you, Sam, since uh, you ended so wonderfully uh, speaking about your title, which demands this answer. Um, did, you, did you have moments where you um, discovered moments of where you can become something um, that is distinct? Sorry, you cut out a little bit. Um, could you repeat your question? Um, yes. So I would specifically to your title, um, you, you know, you have this title that is like demanding an answer. Tell me who you are. And you you return to that at the end of your talk. I'm wondering if there were moments. Um, place or the other. Up... 
Oh my God, I'm really sorry. You, you cut out again at the very end of your question. Okay. Um, I will type my question. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm happy to address Jess's question about assimilation. Um, you know, Leela Grotha, the curator, puts it very eloquently when she writes that Yagmai experiences a cultural amnesia of sorts, one in which she is continuously waking up to her own identity. Um, Rosha's father, Siamak, um, Rosha characterizes him as, quote, um, so involved with being an American. Um, which, of course, is a, is a nuanced and complex thing to say, given the violence of the revolution. Um, his reticence um, may have been um, uh, protective or, or, or benevolent, um, but um, Rosha describes her father as, very, as being sort of um, invest to, to, to greatly simplify. Um, Rosha describes her father as being invested in a sort of um, assimilationist project. Um, Rosha herself is sort of exploring all of these various textures of difference. Um, you know, she is really cut off. As I said in my presentation, she's cut off from a comprehensive knowledge of her Persian filial past. And so through a combination of intuition and research, through this intuitive sense that a familial history is with her, even genetically, um, she is sort of mining um, these residues of um, Persian family history um, through, through her art making. While identity art was an important way to claim space starting in the 70s and 80s, today artists have the tendency to be ambivalent about the performance of identity, even that are sensitive to this dynamic. When institutions were to present themselves as anti-racist and feature non-white artists, I know this is a loaded question. So I mean, I, I, I think maybe um, um, about the, and, um, you know, how she's thinking about identity as it appears in her installation, maybe. Um, and thinking back to maybe um, earlier work coming out of the 70s and 80s when that was more explicit, because of course, in, in the installation, we have body parts, but we do not have bodies in a traditional sense. Um, how, is, how is that different? I'm happy to um, respond. Um, Sam, jump in whenever you'd like. Um, yeah, I, um, as I said in my presentation, the Farsi in the installation is distorted to the threshold of meaninglessness. So I would definitely characterize ambivalence um, as uh, Kathy so eloquently describes it. Um, I would, I would foreground ambivalence as a key aspect of the way that Rosha is dealing with identity in Miracle Grow. She's literally combining a TV theme, shot, TV, uh, theme song um, filmed in Santa Monica, where um, she grew up in the US with a Persian pop song from the 70s. Um, and so, you know, literally, literally juxtaposing uh, orally, orally, um, these um, two different fragments of, of her identity. Um, yeah, her work is her work is um, nuanced and subtle. And um, I would, um, I think that it's very different than the art historical touchstones um, from the 70s and 80s. Um, I think it's radically different than some of the art historical touchstones that um, Kathy perhaps has in mind in her question. Yeah, I think um, to answer kind of both Tom's question and Kathy's question, um, I'm thinking a lot about the relationship between body and identity and um, where works in the 70s and 80s that dealt with identity 
um, how, I guess as I'm thinking about them, we're a little bit more explicit in that relationship. The work seen in like Waste Not and my grandmother's album, they really like expand the idea of how much of your identity is contained in the body that you're in. And that like, um, there are so many different subtleties to identity, not just the powers that seek to oppress you because of those identities, but also the ways in which the authors of these archives expand their definitions of their bodies through the objects and the things that they make. And in doing that kind of reassert their autonomy and their, um, their identities and despite all of those things. If that makes sense. I tried to kind of address both of them. Um, Dan, if you could, you know, Thomas's question here about reflection um, and, and boundaries and bodies. Um, I am, I'm, I'm really most compelled. Um, I'm still grappling with the issue of um, reflection and boundary in your question. Um, so I'm going to respond to what's feeling a little bit more concrete to me in terms of disembodiment. Um, both my methodology, uh, as I explained in the presentation, my methodology is dependent upon contemporary turns, perhaps in the last 10 years in transgender theory, particularly indebted to the, the scholarship of Lucas Crawford um, that allows um, queer and trans theorists to find trans subjectivity beyond the body and beyond the autobiography. So there's definitely an issue of um, disembodiment or a new role for the physical lived body within transgender theory. Um, to say that that's an instance of disembodiment would be a simplification because there are these metaphors to the body. Um, but there is a new, more complicated role for the body in transgender theory um, in the contemporary transgender theory that I draw upon in my research. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know that that's a comprehensive answer to your question, Tom, but just um, focusing in on that issue of, of disembodied. Oh, also, um, to, to briefly append that, Rosha and I have very different arguments about the piece, and a keystone of Rosha's argument about what Miracle Grow is doing has to do with psychedelia. And so I think there's also an issue of altered psychic states, or even disembodied psychic states, um, or trippy, for lack of a better, trippy, as it were, modes of embodiment um, that are going on in the piece. Really, um, we need our Q&A right now and um we'll move on to um a, are, jackie are we taking a quick break right now my schedule no we'll move right to the um introduction of the alumni award winner yeah, okay. by becca carl and daniel thank you so much panel three Fantastic. well done um, Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the CCA Visual and Critical Studies class of 2021, and in collaboration with Carl Daum and Daniel Thomas, it is my honor to introduce alumni award recipient, Carolina Magis Weinberg. Mexican-born Magis Weinberg earned her undergraduate degree from La Esmeralda, the National School of Art in Mexico City. She is the 2017 CCA alumna and recipient recipient of prestigious scholarships, including the Fulbright Garcia Robles Scholarship, the Yoso Amaguchi Print Media Scholarship, and received support from Mexico's National Foundation for Culture and Arts. She has presented in solo and group exhibitions internationally, including the third Camayas Triennial. And since October, 2019, she served as the artistic director of La Revista de la Universidad de México, the monthly publication produced by UNAM and the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Magis Weinberg's creative world is full of clever and playful connections between people, concepts, and material. At CCA, she analyzed how accents immediately determine a speaker in a space as local or foreign. 
Her VCS thesis project focused on the work of contemporary artist Rivan Neuschweinder and possibly the and possibility of regaining agency in the representation of one's identity through the accent. In her MFA thesis installation, Madge Weinberg gathered confetti produced in far-flung locations. She constructed tapestries from these materials to reflect on geography, language, and semantics. She presented her mo most, most recent work, Returning to Proximity, at the Berkeley Art Museum in collaboration with Raphael Viet and Play Press Scenes. The performance brought the audience and artists together by mapping their bodies in relation to one another and in relation to various centers. Magus Weinberg's most recent essays on, art, on artists including Ranu Mukherjee and Vincent Rojo appear in Revista de la Universidad de México and literary magazine Letas Libres. Currently, she leads a reoccurring workshop at the Ready-Made Museum in Mexico City called Incursions into the Ready-Made, where she engages the public in exercises that critically explore the relationship to the museum. Today, on behalf of the VCS class of 2021, we honor her achievements by bestowing upon her the bronze pencil. It is a long-standing tradition that each graduating class receives pencils printed with a motto. This bronze pencil reflects our values and aspirations as researchers and curators. With it, we celebrate Magus Weinberg's prolific work as a writer, artist, and teacher. She's an inspiration in her field, and we appreciate the work she's done. Felicidades, Carolina Magus Weinberg. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. And see what I have in my hands right now. The, the coveted bronze pencil. Jackie, thank you for making this happen. And I'm so touched by your words, Becca, and the words you put together to have my work be seen, read, understood by such a brilliant cohort. Your, your, all of your papers were amazing. The Spring Symposium, since the first time I went to one, felt like the most well put together event where everybody should be, where everybody should be learning. So I'm just amazed to be part of this event again. And with the full honor I feel today of being the VCS alumni awardee. It feels Im impossible, incredible. And I really thank you for, for this honor. Um, I wanna say, I never felt like I could be on the shoes of the amazing people we honored with the award before. So I take this award with a lot of responsibility. And as you know, now we all, everybody here, we all have the VCS accent. So now the job is to go out into the world and use this accent purposefully, respectfully, with all of the power it, it uh, implies. Uh, and we, and you will never be the same after the VCS program, I'm sure. Now life is different, your eyes see different. It, it really does change you. So I'm, I, again, I'm really not speechless. I think I'm never speechless. <laughs> and really, I honor your accent, whatever that is, in whichever form it comes. Everybody here has proposed already a very particular reading and taking on very complicated subjects. Everybody did today an amazing job and everybody in VCS always does. And you'll see little worlds, words that, that have been said today will start coming through in your life from this moment on. Thank you for the award and thank you everyone. Thank you VCS, I love you. <laughs> I want to thank Carolina again for her um, heartfelt and brilliant presentation. And of course, to Becca and Daniel and Carl for that finely crafted introduction of Carolina. So everyone, another happy round of applause. I invite the class of 2021 to come on camera. I think there are a few people still coming in. We were just here and we'll return.
I'll get started. And some will keep on their uh, audio without the video. So to the class of 2021, I congratulate you on your work today and throughout the academic year. Um, no doubt the audience, family, colleagues, friends, CCA and VCS alums recognizes and is inspired by the intellectual labor on display on this fine May day. We are proud of you and we hope you are proud of yourselves. Please mark this moment, each of you, with a round of applause. Of course, we all wish that we could be together to cheer and appreciate today's triumph in person. When it's safe to do so, we'll invite the class of 2021 to a raucous celebration and reunion on the CCA campus. So watch your inboxes and maybe even your text messages. We might text you. <laughs> Today, wherever you are, revel in the moment and embrace the joy of your achievement. You have given us a model of scholarly success and of making ways to share your rigorous research, analysis, informed interpretation, and compelling writing about art, object making, and cultural production. Don't stop. Your research, your writing, your scholarship, your activism, your art making are essential labors world building vocations and humanist care for social and public good and for our gentle and fragile planet. Create together, collaborate with others, continue the invaluable work of listening, asking questions of yourselves and keep making space for everyone to thrive in a fairer and more just world. Let's celebrate this opportunity and your achievement today Class of 2021 symposium presenters with some final remarks from you in virtual toast. Okay, uh, and now let's um, raise our glasses and give our gratitude to the amazing faculty who have guided us and prepared us for this culminating moment. Your leadership and empathy have been a beacon against the backdrop of a most tumultuous year. And a big, big cheers to the VCS cohort, um, whose communal support and collaboration is truly the soul of the program. The quality of relationships that we have fostered here, I hope to see echoed in all of our future academic endeavors. And finally, I would also like to toast my colleagues and the former faculty from SFAI for helping nurture our fledgling projects from the very beginning, believing in us and graciously supporting us from afar as we transitioned into our new program at CCA. Cheers. And with the final word, I toast your future endeavors. There will be many and I can't wait. Thank you so much. Thank you to our audience today and thank you VCS class of 2021. Cheers. I'd like to take a moment to just acknowledge the faculty advisors for the class of 2021. This year has brought uncertainty and precarity at every turn. Throughout our projects, the advisors have supported and challenged our work. Without their support, many of these projects would remain uncompleted. Please join me in toasting the faculty members that have kept us focused. Here's to Monica Bravo, Thomas Hackinson, Glenn Halfand, Genevieve Hyacinth, Jeanette Rohn, and Ignacio Valero. May these relationships forged in the most difficult of times continue to be deep wells of friendship and lifelong support. To Dr. Kathy Zarur and Dr. Jez Flores Garcia, the class of 2021 thanks you both for being such thoughtful and astute readers of our research, as well as tireless mentors. Our deepest appreciation goes out to both you, to, to, to both of you for your criticality as well as your affection. A special thanks to each of you for your tremendous care and label through the hurdles of this pandemic year. Cheers to Dr. Kathy Zaru and Dr. Jez Flores Garcia. I also wanted to give a toast to both Jackie and Sean Jay for your leadership, your organization your check-ins and your support throughout this entire semester. You know, there's been a lot going on for all of us individually and 
we just all want to share a huge thanks and gratitude for all of the humor and the care that you've showed us throughout the last year and the last few years for some of us. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, everybody out there. We really uh, loved having you on this Zoom call, this webinar, and have a great rest of your Saturday. <laughs>